Professor of Brewing Science at uh, Nottingham University. Uh, David's, going to look, going to, David's going to look at the trends in brewing raw material usage and the centre roles of barley. Now, just to warn you that this meeting is going to be recorded, and if you don't want to be shown during the recording, please put your uh, video cameras off. And can I ask that all your uh, you're all on mute during David's talk? So I'm just going to hand you over to David. Um, the final thing is, if you want to ask questions, please do it through the chat box, um, and we'll and we'll and we'll bring these at the end of David's uh, presentation. David, over to yourself. Excellent. Um, thank you very much, George. Appreciate your introduction and my thanks to the International Barley Hub for inviting me to uh, give this presentation. Uh, they asked me to um, come along and give a perspective really um, from the brewing industry on barley as a raw material. Um, and I could have interpreted that in many ways. We could have looked at you know traits that we want to encourage in barley breeding, for example. Uh, but I wanted to come and talk to you about some of the research that we do at Nottingham as well as giving a perspective. So. Um, the narrative I've, I've stitched together is very much to look at Bali's place in the sort of pantheon of brewing raw materials, where it uh, has a sort of historical uh, preeminence. And I wanted to look at the competition and some of the different forms that we use uh, raw materials in in brewing. And then um, cover some recent research that we've been doing at Nottingham, uh, looking at alternative forms of barley uh, for use in the brewing process. So let's um, start at the beginning. Um, you know what, what's beer made from, just to make sure everyone's on the same page. Uh, well, barley malt traditionally is the source of starch in which the brewing process. And during brewing, we break the starch down to sugars, which yeast then ferments to produce alcohol. And that's the sort of core mass balance in brewing. Uh, we, of course, um, we mash the barley malt with water and beer in the end of the day um, is typically greater than 90% water. So water is a key um, ingredient in, in the quality of, of finished beer. We add hops for bitterness and aroma, and we use yeast to ferment those sugars to alcohol, as already mentioned. So those are, if you like, the big four traditional ingredients in brewing. Um, but to bring that up to date, uh, there are many other materials which can be used and, and indeed are used according either to local legislation or company practice. So there are materials we call adjuncts. And these are alternative sources of um, extract in brewing. So other sources of starch or sugars that can be added to brewing other than barley malt. Uh, we have a range of roasted malts and roasted products that we can add for colour and flavour to produce things like um, stouts, darker beer styles, or um, indeed the copper colours of ales. Um, we can use enzymes, again, where permitted, depends on the, uh, the country, and it also depends on the company as to whether or not they'll permit the use of exogenous enzymes, but these can be added. Uh, and then there are other process aids that can be used, um, for example, um, um, antifoams might be added into a fermenter um, to aid with throughput. So why why it was barley and why is barley the cereal of choice for brewing? Well, there's a number of reasons, and hopefully I cover some of the big ones uh, on this slide. Uh, firstly, it's widely grown and well adapted cereal that's suited to temperate climates. So it's grown uh, across many regions of the of the globe. It's got a high carbohydrate or um, starch content in particular, and a low lipid content. And the low lipid content, as it happens, is quite good from a perspective of the product stability. Um, so lipids, higher levels of lipids in raw materials tend to give us issues with oxidative rancidity through uh, shelf life. Another key thing about barley um, on malting, in other words, on, on industrial germination of the seed, it produces this perfect blend of enzymes with which to digest its own starch. So it produces the natural uh, alpha amylase, beta amylase, and limit dextrinase that we're then going to use to break the starch down to sugars in the brewing process. And this was one of the world's earliest biotechnologies, uh, learning that if we germinated barley, it would then digest its own starch and break it down to uh, sugars. The gelatinization temperature of barley malt starch is low enough to enable conversion with its own enzymes. Um, 
might be a bit wordy for those of you not from a brewing background, but uh, essentially um, the starch is densely packed in granules in the raw material. And as brewers, we have to hydrate that um, and solubilize it so that enzymes can break the starch down. And that process is called gelatinization. Uh, and for barley malt starch, this happens between about 62 and 67 degrees uh, Celsius, depending on the harvest and the barley variety, et cetera. Um, but what that means is that that's still within the range of activity of the diastatic enzymes. So you can mash the barley and with different temperature stands, control the breakdown of the starch into sugars. Now that's certainly possible for some raw materials, but it's not possible for tropical grains that I'm gonna go on to talk about, um, such as things like rice or maize, which have higher gelatinization temperatures. Uh, continuing reasons why barley is popularized for malting and brewing, well, it has a husk, a protective husk, and um, that's really quite helpful in terms of uh, mechanical handling and conveying around the malting plant. It also forms a natural filter bed uh, in the brewing process, which we use uh, to recirculate work through, clarify the wort, uh, and um, uh, separate the spent grains from uh, the soluble um, uh, sweet liquid. And I guess the last one is is just about preference and human habits. You know, if you uh, long enough make um, beer traditionally from barley malt, then over time your consumers develop a flavour preference for all malt beers. And indeed, um, you know, when people move to make new recipes to use different adjunct materials, um, as you might see it to dilute the quality of an all malt beer, um, then people who are used to that will hold that up as the, the bastion of quality and they won't like necessarily um, moving away from that. So tradition is another reason. And this is just a, a slide I'm fond of showing students to uh, support the fact that I say that barley contains a lot of carbohydrate and starch. You can see a longitudinal section of the grain here, and the embryo has been stained to show it's a viable embryo, so that makes it nice and clear there. And you can see the dominance of the starchy endosperm. And in the table at the bottom that we have carbohydrate, um, approximately 78% on a dry matter. Um, this is not all starch, um, but usually greater than 65% or so is, the remainder being um, uh, other carbohydrate materials such as cell walls. So I mentioned brewing adjuncts. These are alternative sources of our sugars for fermentation to alcohol. They are quite literally an adjunct to the use of malted barley. And we break these down according to where they're used in the process. Um, so cereal adjuncts, these will have to be added early on in the brewing process. They're starch extracted and broken down. Um, where the starch gelatinization temperature that I've already mentioned is um, within convenient mashing temperatures. In other words, where the enzymes are still active, uh, as is the case with materials like um, uh, barley, uh, wheat, uh, oats, rye then we can add these directly into a mash. Um, where we have tropical grains such as maize, uh, rice, sorghum, then there's a separate cooking process first of all to gelatinize the starch and then we add that into a main mash and allow the enzymes to break down the starch. The second option um, is, is, is not to use cereals at all but to use um, uh, liquid adjuncts or sugar syrups. Uh, these, of course, are often derived from cereals, so things like maize syrups or invert sugar syrups. Uh, these, these can be added um, later on in the process, actually, usually during the boil in the kettle. Now, our definition of an adjunct as an alternative source of extract, um, that excludes processes um, based predominantly on another cereal. In other words, if we don't use any barley malt at all, we talk about brewing with alternative raw materials. and. Um, Yes, indeed, that is entirely possible. Uh, and a key example is that of sorghum, which I've put on the slide here. So in Africa, um, this originated in Nigeria in the late eighties because the uh, government banned uh, imports of malt. Uh, so very quickly they had to look at alternative raw materials with which to brew. So it's quite possible to brew with 100% of another uh, cereal. Quite often you have to add exogenous enzymes um, because of some of those unique benefits of barley, which I commented on earlier, um, you know, sorghum, for example, is, is deficient in uh, beta amylase uh, and, uh, you know, moderately challenged in terms of some other uh, mash enzymes as well. 
And the use of adjuncts varies greatly worldwide. Um, uh, in Germany, they still have the ancient purity law, the Reinheitsgebot, which um, forbids the use of non-malt sources of extract uh, for beers produced according to that protocol. Um, whereas in North America and China, uh, 40 to 50 percent adjunct usage may be employed uh, by some brewers. So why would we use materials other than barley malt? Well, of course, depending upon um, market conditions and where you are in the world, it may be that it's a cheaper source of extract. So there may be something that is easier and cheaper to get hold of and use and that you can use effectively in the brewing process. Um, there may be uh, difficulties sourcing good quality malt. So it may not just be about the local um, sources of other materials. It may be that actually it's difficult to get hold of uh, high quality malting barley. The next one's one that a lot of people use adjuncts for um, because all of the different uh, cereals and syrups that you will add will imp impact on the finished beer in different ways. Um, for example, as listed here, you know, we might use some wheat for foam. Uh, rice, it commonly has a very neutral color. So you might use that to give you a nice pale color um, in the finished beer. And all of the cereals will have their own distinct impacts on flavor and mouthfeel. And coupled with that, therefore, we might be wanting to brew novel beer styles. We might be wanting to move away from, you know, traditional all malt brews. Unmalted adjuncts have a lower carbon footprint because they haven't been through the malting process. And I'm going to come back to that later on in the talk because it's relevant to the couple of case studies I'm going to go through. And there are taxation regimes that um, actually encourage adjunct usage. So I've put up uh, Hapishu as an example. Uh, Japanese category Hapishu, there's an example over on the right. Um, these are beers which are specified as containing originally uh, less than 67% of malt, uh, and they were then subject to lower taxation regimes. Uh, and again, this encouraged diversity of raw material usage and developed novel categories of beverages. Um, and there are now several bandings uh, according to the malt content of the beer. And another reason we sometimes use liquid adjuncts is to expand capacity of a brewery because they don't have to be mashed. Um, so at the front end, if you've got a limitation on capacity, uh, you can add liquid adjuncts either in the, in the um, uh, kettle or actually later on directly into a fermenter. Um, and therefore, if you're a given size of brew house, that they enable you to produce uh, more um, beer at sales gravity. So yeah, I summarized Barley has competition and this table's taken from a, uh, uh, a book chapter by Good and Arendt. Um, a few years ago now, it shows you the diversity of different raw materials um, that brewers have available to them. Now that, that's not to say that all of these are widespread. Uh, in the following slides, I'm gonna show you some of the most popular um, brewing materials by region across the world. But you can see that we have on the right, many different cereals and on the left, many different forms of those cereals in which they can cook. Some are far more common than other, others. Um, and of course, the expense of the particular um, product. So things like extrusion cooked st starch sources, really quite rare to use, um, but we might quite commonly use flours, um, syrups or grits, which are the name given to uncooked endosperm fragments. So here's some data from a few years ago, looking at global market share uh, for adjuncts. And if we go around starting with uh, corn and corn starch top right, you'll see that's got the lion's share at 35%. So corn or maize, depending upon your nomenclature, um, that's the number one adjunct competition to barley globally. Um, syrups of non-specified origin, as I say, there's a number of different sources of sugar syrups that can be used in brewing approximately 20% of the market, um, very similar to rice. And then note, barley itself can be used as an adjunct. Uh, am I talking rubbish? No, keep up. Um, it doesn't have to be malted. So uh, yeah, unmalted or raw barley is itself a major adjunct, an alternative to the use of barley malt. And again, if out of these adjuncts, it would have, as the box indicates, the closest taste to malt. Um, will be cheaper and actually to some extent more environmentally friendly in terms of not having gone through the malting process. 
but of course will also have many drawbacks as a raw material, such as lack of enzymes and lack of modification of the endosperm, so high levels of things like beta-glucans in which to the brewing process. And some more market data showing you um, the first three columns where these um, particular cereals and syrups are prevalent. So the first three columns are adjunct usage as percent of beers produced in the region. Um, so you can see, for example, that Eastern Europe, um, there might be about 30% of beers that are using mashed in barley and wheat, in other words, unmalted barley and wheat products. Um, but that is the highest and it's quite low elsewhere down to 0% in North America, where their preference is very much for syrups and cereal cooked uh, maize or rice. Uh, and China, you can see again, a similar preference where around about 45% of beers produced using those adjunct materials. On the far right column, you've got um, the average percent adjunct used in a recipe, um, just giving you some sort of idea about extent of adjunct usage. You can see that the Chinese market on average is far higher in terms of its adjunct use. And to, to some extent, um, that um, reflects the balance of trade on malt in China. You know, they, they, they are a net importer of uh, malt because they do not produce uh, anyway, anywhere near as much barley malt as they use in brewing. So, you know, a key driver there for using alternative raw materials. And if we think of unmalted barley as an adjunct, well, um, as I said, it, it can be considered to lower the water footprint, the carbon footprint, uh, and the energy usage of malting and brewing, uh, because you're not taking it through the malting process, and a malting process involves steeping the grain in, in water, um, usually twice, sometimes once in certain um, uh, certain systems, uh, then allowing it to germinate and controlling humidified air for four or five days and then drying it down on a kiln, which really uses a lot of the energy involved in malting. So uh, these charts on this slide are just making the point from a recent paper, um, I, I should hasten to add, published by uh, DuPont, so clearly on the side of brewing with enzymes, um, but uh, this data shows comparisons of the energy use per hectolitre of beer in megajoules and the carbon footprint kilograms per hectolitre of brewing, um, so, sorry, of malting and brewing. And you've got the bar in blue, which is existing, and then the bar in blue hatched is if you replace this with 100% unmalted barley instead of malt uh, and showing considerable energy savings and carbon footprint savings according to the life cycle analysis reported in that paper. Um, in the other, the other columns are just other regions of the world. So we've got um, uh, Africa and we've got Argentina. And in each case, they've used their unmalted sorghum as the comparison material. But again, you can see the principle. If you use unmalted grains, uh, there's less energy usage in which the process even when you do a full life cycle analysis and you take account of the water and the energy used to generate the enzymes. So um, the modern industry can handle 0 to 100% unmalted grist materials. I, I mentioned that the sorghum brewing process has been developed in Africa now for many years, um, using really quite a challenging raw material in terms of sorghum with a high starch gelatinization temperature. Um, and, and some, some low enzyme levels. And basically, you adjust the enzyme levels that you add into the mash to digest the grist, and you're replacing that natural role uh, of malting. Um, the upwards limit is not actually based on technology and whether or not we can process this. The, the usual upwards limit on the incorporation of adjuncts, which you kind of saw in those, those tables I was showing you, is really um, based on sensory product quality rather than um, brewing process technology. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, when replacing malt with unmalted barley, and people have obviously produced beers with 100% unmalted barley and adjuncts, uh, it was, uh, sorry, and enzymes, that was something that was done in the old East Germany, for example, many years ago. Uh, and recently, again, with the development of specific enzyme blends by companies such as Novozymes, um, there's been a move again towards evaluating unmalted barley beers 
And the typical, at the high levels of adjunct, what we find is you lose a characteristic of all malt beers, which is difficult to describe in individual terms, but it's a loss of malty fullness in the mouthfeel. And you tend to start to develop lingering bitterness and a tingly mouthfeel. So all is not well once you get above about sort of 40% uh, unmalted barley. Below that, you can probably brew really with only minor adjustments to a brand profile and enzyme usage. So uh, what causes this? And this was a question of the first piece of research that I'm going to um, run through now with you. Um, and this is um, shortly to be published, actually, in a paper by uh, Joanna York, myself and a colleague, uh, Tristan Dew at the university, where we used untargeted metabolomic profiling to look at the differences between 100% malt beers and those made with unmalted barley adjunct. So, in other words, without actually specifically targeting, we used a, uh, a liquid MS uh, method to look at all of the different features identified in um, barley beers versus 100% malt beers, and then try to identify those which could be causing the noted sensory differences. I thought I'd start with some sensory data. Otherwise, all I've given you is, is my um, conclusion uh, about those changes in sensory aspects as um, we increase the proportion of barley in, in, in such beers. So this is some consumer data from our research, uh, and it's, it's generated using what's called check all that apply or CATA um, as a consumer technique. In other words, the consumers have a list of attributes and they check them if it applies to a particular beer. So it's not an intensity, it's a frequency of observation that's being reported um, uh, in these tables. And I highlight at the bottom the bitterness and lingering bitterness that I've shown. You can see the p-value shows highly significant differences. In the left hand of the three um, results columns, we have 100% uh, malt and the frequencies of usage of these terms. And then we have a recipe with 35% barley. It says slash W because all of the, all of the recipes, um, apart from the 100% malt, included a, a low level of wheat but it was the barley that we were changing. So 35% barley and then up to 45%. And you can see that at the highest level, we're really starting to get a lot of um, check or would apply comments in terms of bitter and lingering bitterness. Not only that, when we looked at the hedonic data, in other words, the data that tells us whether the consumers liked or didn't like the bitterness that they were getting, because you know, you'll get a certain amount of bitterness either way with beers. You know, people will report it there as a as a um, as a characteristic. But is it liked or is it disliked? And you'll see here um, that in terms of disliking terms, the use of bitterness with other synonyms that the panelists use, you know, moderate bitterness, quite bitter, harsh bitterness. Um, yeah, you can really see that the 100% malt has a low citation for that. But as we increase the barley um, proportion in the grist, uh, the consumers start to report this bitterness and this bitter aftertaste, the lingering bitterness at the lower level of the um, table. And there's a correspondence analysis um, showing this. It's, it's, it's a bit like, if you haven't seen these before, it's a bit like a, a PCA for non-continuable variables. So you can see again that the lingering bitterness as a disliking term is closely associated with the 45% barley level. Um, so these are the kind of sensory differences that we were interested in. What is it that causes um, the differences? And we'd done the usual um, uh, chemical analysis of, of beers. In, in other words, we'd looked at things like um, uh, polyphenols. We'd analysed the flavours of the different beers. And we'd done huge amounts of PCAs and sort correlations. And, and nothing really fell out in terms of obvious precursors of these characteristics which was why we chose to do this untargeted metabolomic study. Uh, in other words, we don't know what's causing this, so we'll have a look at everything and see if when we filter it all down, we can find anything that appears to correlate uh, and help us explain these differences in sensory perception. So, yep, we adopted an untargeted metabolomics workflow. The next few slides run through the, the method. I will probably go through them quite quickly here because I want to focus on the main findings but I've put them in so that anybody looking at the presentation later can see the details and hopefully check the study was done correctly. So we, th this is the important bit. We used three lager beers in the study, an all malt control brewed with 100% barley malt, 
The two beers produce um, with 85% malt, but 15% unmalted barley adjunct, and these were called barley one and barley two. Uh, now, fit only 15% unmalted adjunct, so I'm not going right up towards the higher levels um, that I said were more challenging. Why is that? Well, we want to look at compositional differences induced by um, use of unmalted barley. And we wanted, therefore, to pick an adjunct level that we could brew at comfortably without changing the recipe. In other words, without starting to introduce um, you know, novel enzymes into the mash or starting to adjust additions to compensate for loss of free amino nitrogen in the work, for example. Um, so 15%, which is a, a decent amount of substitution, if there are different components in those raw materials going to cause differences in the composition of beer, you should be able to spot it with a sensitive metabolomic study. And barley one and barley two, they're both raw barleys. Um, and I'm not allowed to say anything more about that because that was the hypothesis of the study that is uh, as yet uh, commercial IP. Um, safe to say that um, barley one was the standard um, unmalted barley untreated and barley two had been treated so as to try to make it um, uh, more palatable in terms of the finished beers. But I'm not allowed to say anything more about that. He said with an air of mystery. Um, OK, so sample. Preparation, again, there have been previous um, un untargeted metabolomic studies on beer, so we adopted a, a standard method already published, uh, and the details are given there about how we prepared the samples and that we used a, a pooled QC sample, which is injected repeatedly uh, throughout the runs, and that's a composite of all of the uh, test beers. Again, this is sort of fairly standard protocol. Um, the analysis was done on a uh, UHPLC uh, TOF MS. Um, it's electrospray ionization. That's what the ASI stands for. So you can do it in positive and negative ion mode and look at different groups of compounds that way. Um, separation and uh, gradient conditions all given there for completeness. And as an overview of the results now, you know, this is um, very much like barley breeding, actually. It's, it's, it's all a question of narrowing down the numbers. So a lot of it's about filtration. So we had to come up with criteria to narrow down the features. So your, your features are basically ions produced in the mass spectrometer at a set time um, uh, with, with, a, with a certain mass to charge ratio. Um, and these were narrowed down um, across all of the um, samples using the criteria that there had to be a significant difference between the intensity of the peaks at P is less than 0 0.01 and between at least two of the different beer samples. There had to be an intensity fault change of more than 50. In other words, we weren't interested in things that just change subtly. And the signal had to be greater than 10,000 on the MS. That was, again, to cut out low, lower level noise. And using those features, we sorry, using those um, filters, we screened down to um, 92 features across both iron modes of the MS, where the 15% barley beers contained more of a particular feature significantly relative to the 100% malt or barley two beers. And again, we did the comparisons the other way with the barley two beers, which were the ones that we'd adjusted with our process um, and compared those. So again, another 88 features identified there. So we've now, now narrowed it down and we've got a, a manageable number of features to start to investigate and look at what they are. We do that with peak identification uh, and I've just identified the software um, and the match criteria, which I'll then quote later on. So, you know, serious GUI software gives us a match between 0 and 100 percent and CSI finger ID identity suggests what the compound is likely to be and gives us the formula and chemical class. And again, the criteria for reporting the features so that we narrow down. So we didn't report matches that really were not very good. So we went for a serious score greater than 50 percent and a CSI finger ID score between minus 150 and zero, the closer to zero, the closer it is as a hit. So all of this just told us, you know, that we've narrowed this down to looking at some features that really are significantly changing and that we have at least a reasonable assignment on in terms of their mass spectrum. And given an overview, the differential metabolites between um, unmalted barley beers and all malt beers came from a range of chemical classes, as you'd expect for that number of features. But the things that sort of stood out were things like peptides, um, purines, 
secondary alcohols, chains of sugars, oligosaccharides, uh, and some derivatives of, of, of benzoic acid. Now I'm going to run through um, some of the main ones of these that link in with our theories about the, the, the sensory changes in unmalted barley beers. So um, the most recurrent class identified in these differential compounds were peptides. And we identified a range of di, tri, and tetrapeptides as being differential. And in this table, I've listed some of them. They've got feature numbers, which um, uh, correlate with the uh, the chapter of the thesis that this was all originally reported in. You have to give everything a feature number, so it's got a mass spectrum and an identity. Um, and then on the far right-hand column, you can see these are features for which 15% barley 1, the standard unmalted barley, was significantly higher in the peptide relative to what's stated below. So the top uh, eight or so rows, they're all, it's it's all significantly higher than in 100% malt beer. Top three, it was higher than 100% malt and the processed barley two beer, for example. And the lower four were only higher relative to the barley two beer. That's the statistics uh, element coming into them. Um, so we've got a lot of different levels of peptides um, in, in, in these instances, higher with these sequences that we picked out. Um, now, it shouldn't come as too much surprise at a top level that peptides are something that vary between unmalted and malted um, barley beers, because a lot of the proteolysis that occurs and the development, indeed, of the proteolytic enzymes occurs during malting. So if we go straight into the brewing process, and you're using the enzymes present in the 85% um, in your brewing process, then that will have a different action on the protein that is there present in intact unmalted barley. So not too surprising, but interesting at how much it stood out in terms of the study results. And the point I want to make is that peptides have taste impacts. So they can induce taste and mouthfeel sensations. Um, I've given an example here. You can see a mass feature at um, mass 332 in positive iron mode, um, which this peptide, uh, glutamic acid, alanine leucine. Um, and, uh, you know, really, really good match in terms of its identity. So we're pretty confident that's what it is. And we found that several of our um, peptides had this um, leucine residue um, uh, at the um, uh, C terminus. And indeed, that's been reported in the literature, these papers that I'm showing here, uh, to impart bitterness uh, to peptides. So the fact we identified several with leucine in this terminal position um, made us suspect that this might be one factor contributing bitterness to beers made from uh, unmalted barley. And the, the theory in terms of this, this paper is that the hydrophobic residue at the C-terminus, which I've, I've ringed there, acts as a binding site between bitter peptides and taste receptor cells, and that's why they're more bitter. And it seems from our study um, that doubtless due to the relative enzyme activities and the, uh, the substrates of the unmalted barley proteins that are mashed on, on peptides, um, you get more of these uh, bitter peptides. We also identified as significantly different um, gamma glutamide peptides, and these are associated with Kakumi taste. Now, gamma glutamide peptide, um, as the name hopefully implies, is one where the peptide link is formed with the gamma um, carboxyl group on glutamic acid. Um, and so here's an example, gamma glutamide tyrosine, which again we found to be higher in the unmodified barley 1 um, relative to uh, barley 2. Now, these have been detected in a range of different um, fermented food products, cheese, soy sauce, fermented fish. And they impart what's called kokumi active taste in food products. So this is a known phenomenon that's being increasingly studied where they enhance the continuity and mouthfulness of taste perception. Uh, I've just reported some papers here um, that um, shown that kokumi peptides have been found in beers previously. So this has been reported. And we know that um, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the yeast used in brewing, can form gamma glutamyl peptides because it's got a gamma glutamyl transferase. So, assumedly, we're getting differential levels because of the differential peptides that we're putting in, and then the yeast is forming um, uh, enhanced levels, in this case, of cocumi active uh, taste 
compounds. So yeah, these can uh, enhance mouthfulness and they can exhibit bitterness and or astringency. So again, these are um, key targets, if you like, for future investigations to try and investigate um, the source of this lingering due to the enhanced continuity and increased bitterness, perhaps due to these and perhaps due to the uh, other bitter peptides that I've mentioned already, which are accentuated in unmalted um, barley beers. Well, the second class I mentioned that we got several hits of different uh, features were the purines. Uh, so things like a purine nucleoside here, um, and, and adenine and, and derived uh, structures. And again, these are groups of compounds, um, these nucleic acid breakdown products that are known to have flavor enhancing products. Uh, and they're recognized for influencing flavor. So it's a bit of a similar story to, or a similar hypothesis, I guess, to the issue with proteolysis and protein breakdown. Um, you know, basically the nucleic acids are there and they're present in barley, but very few survive malting and mashing. So we get them broken down um, and the degradation products are then present in beer. Things like nucleotides, as example shown on the right hand side, nucleosides and uh, purine and pyrimidine bases. And malting and mashing are the key steps at which nucleotidases hydrolyze um, uh, and, and remove phosphate from the nucleotides. And then the glycosidic linkage uh, between the purine and the sugar moiety can be cleaved by nucleosidases. So this is these are the pathways giving rise to those compounds that I showed previously. And again, clearly, if we use unmalted barley rather than malted barley, the breakdown that has already happened in malting is not um, happening for that raw material. So you've got a different feedstock going into the mash with a different background concentration and activity of these enzymes. So use of unmalted barley increases nucleic acid content uh, in the mash. And interestingly, another group that had done untargeted metabolomic studies on beer, in, in their case, not looking at differences in adjuncts, but looking at differences in, um, uh, in flavor stability, they'd highlighted purine compounds again as being associated with uh, a sort of corn chip character in beer. It was positively correlated with staling characteristics such as cardboard, bitter and astringent. So not good. And again, just showing you that characteristic um, association with these bitter and astringent qualities that we might associate with barley beers. So the conclusions to that first case study, um, recent work we've been doing, uh, are quite literally, hopefully I've made them clear as we go through, that as we change the proportion of unmalted barley in the grist, as we increase it, we lose malty fullness and we develop lingering bitterness and an astringent tingle. Our untargeted metabolomic study um, looked at what the sources of this could be, we applied rigorous criteria. Two pools of compounds known to impact relevant taste sensations are highlighted. Clearly, there were many more in the full report available in the thesis, um, which differed according to malted versus unmalted barley. And we highlighted here ditri and tetrapeptides and uh, purines and purine breakdown products. And uh, differences in nucleic acid and protein breakdown, um, depending upon whether barley was germinated or not. Are the, rather obvious cause for the differences in levels of those compounds. In particular, we think the Kakumi taste active peptides may contribute to changes in the taste profile. But we do require further sensor instrumental trials to actually validate these hypotheses because at the moment that's exactly what they are. So I'm going to move seamlessly on and go to my second case study, which is all about brewing with a different raw material, green or um, germinated, but not kilned malt. So as opposed to brewing with unmalted barley, this time we take um, barley through steeping and germination, parts of the malting process, and then we brew directly with green malt at high moisture. Uh, the reason for doing so, well, the thought process on this slide, yep, barley when malted produces a perfect blend of enzymes for brewing. So if that's the case, and we've known it for many years, why should we pay to produce enzymes to add when the malting process already generates good levels? And when you look at the malting process in its entirety, the total energy usage per tonne is of the order of about 920 kilowatt hours, of which something like 800 kilowatt hours per tonne are used in kilning. So, yep, eight ninths 
quick mathematics, you can see if you remove the kilning step, you save a lot of energy in terms of the raw material. And that would be great for carbon footprint as well. Um, so why not brew directly from germinated high moisture malt, saving water and energy? The water saved is because the malt's at about 40% moisture post germination. If you brew with it directly, um, then you're not removing it and having to add more water in the brewing process. So there you go. Hopefully I've explained some of these key steps, you know, the why. Um, well, viewed solely from an energy and water use perspective, the brewing and malting processes as they are make little sense. There's sequential wetting and drying. So brewing with green germinated but unkilled malt would reduce the carbon footprint of malting and save water by retaining that already in the germinated malt. Uh, this wasn't a new idea. It had been looked at as long, as long ago by McWilliam and co-workers at Guinness as 1963. But they did do it in Guinness and they did report that, um, you know, there were potential issues in pale or lager beers um, due to off flavours, which I'll come back to in a moment. And uh, this is just for the UK malting sector, uh, estimated to have a 340,000 tonne uh, CO2 footprint per year from malt production. And so we can rapidly see how removing a kilning step could have a very beneficial impact in that regard. So brewing with green malt was attractive to us. It offered opportunities and challenges, and I've, I'm going to summarise those on this slide. Um, it actually has high amounts of the desired enzymes. So the enzyme development is going on through um, steeping and germination. There's a small amount sometimes in stewing on a kiln, but uh, most of the enzyme formation is produced by the end of the germination process. And indeed, some enzymes you will reduce in activity across a kilning cycle. So it's good for the levels of key enzymes, degrading starches and glucans uh, during brewing. It's not kiln, so it has um, uh, no DMSO, which is a compound called dimethyl sulfoxide. Um, I won't say much more about that here, otherwise it's a lesson in itself. Uh, and it's got a reduced thermal heat load, which gives us a lower pool of staling compounds going into the brewing process. So when we look at changes in beer flavour through shelf life, we find that thermal compounds uh, produced during kilning and other thermal stages of the brewing process are actually key compounds that are present in beer in a bound form and through shelf life uh, are released and contribute to the stale character of um, beers that have been aged. So these are all potentially good factors, but there's a negative. There's a there's a challenge um, uh, column as well, which is what has limited the uptake of green malt brewing um, up until now. So it's a perishable commodity because it's at 38 to 46 percent moisture, uh, has limited storability. Um, you know, if you if you want anything other than a moving target and you want it to be stable in terms of microbial spoilage, you would have to be using the raw material within 12 to 24 hours maximum. Um, it's still respiring, so it's changing biochemically, so could be deemed a, mo a moving target. There are process challenges. Um, conventionally, we remove root bits um, from malt after it's been dried on the kiln. We abrade them with a physical process, uh, and the rootlets are deemed to be removed because they impart um, bitter characteristics into finished beer is one of the reasons. Um, but actually, if you're wet, it's a real challenge. And in the study that I'm going to show you, we chose not to remove the rootlets and we brewed with 100% green malt with rootlets on. You lose kiln malt colour and flavour, so nobody's getting away from that. And therefore, in the ultimate solution to brewing with green malt, you may use green malt as an adjunct, or you may actually use it as the major raw material, but then add in some low levels of High, highly kilned or roasted malts to add some colour and flavour back um, as desirable. And the, you know, two of the key quality factors that were highlighted to us when we uh, went into this study are quality factors relevant to um, uh, lager beer quality in particular. Um, so a high lipoxygenase activity is present in green malt and lipoxygenase uh, oxidizes unsaturated fatty acids uh, and these break down in brewing and during shelf life um, to produce uh, staling compounds such as uh, T2-noninal, the famed staling compound of lager beers, uh, 
there are many there's a whole family of these breakdown aldehydes formed from lipid oxidation and uh, lipoxygenases from barley uh, can be at the start of that cycle there's also this compound dimethyl sulfide dms um, this contributes a cooked corn or cabbagey characteristic into lager beers. At low levels, it's a key component of the flavour, of you know, the sulfury character of some lager beers, but you want to keep it um, below or close to threshold um, unless you really want it to be a characteristic. So it can very easily become overpowering and certainly in a pale lager beer, uh, you need to specify low levels of the precursor S-methylmethionine. So these are two particular problems we set out to investigate. When we look at our raw material, um, our green malt, um, in, in our instance, and these are data from the paper cited at the bottom, uh, it's 44.7% moisture. Um, and if we look at the fresh weight, 86% of the weight is the, is the corn and 14% was the rootlets, which we weren't removing. And these are higher in terms of their moisture. The kernel itself was at about 39%. When we look at those other two brewing factors as well that I just mentioned, the S-methylmethionine, um, we've got 46% of total in only 14% of the mass in the rootlets. So, you know, it, 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 that there's a higher concentration of the precursor of dimethyl sulfide in the rootlets. Uh, and again, 34% of total lipoxygenase activity in just 14% of the mass. So brewing uh, with green malt with the rootlets on gives us this additional headache. And these were ones we set out to solve during what was a, a PhD um, uh, uh, project. Uh, and if you want to know more about exactly how we did that, I'm not going to run through it today. I'm going to focus on the brewing trials and show you what was possible. Um, but this was our paper uh, in uh, Journal of the Institute of Brewing, overcoming technical barriers to brewing with green, non-kiln malt, a feasibility study. Uh, essentially, to summarise, we controlled lipoxygenase through its limiting factors. And these were its heat sensitivity, so we would mash in um, directly at the early 60 degrees Celsius um, to minimise its activity in the mash. Um, at a, a low pH, its optimum is pH 6.5, so adjusting the pH down into the um, uh, optimal brewing region of 5.2 to 5.4 keeps you well away from the optimal lipoxygenase activity and denying access to oxygen by using uh, deaerated liquor for milling uh, and indeed uh, for mashing. Now the, uh, the brewing pilot trials, which I'm going to report, these were conducted. This was a European project where the PhD student was mobile across different centres. So the brewing trials were done uh, not at Nottingham, but at Ghent Technology Campus of KU Leuven. Uh, reason being that they have the uh, mirror wet milling facilities, which were required uh, to mill green malt intact um, under deaerated liquor without the presence of oxygen, which is deemed essential when trying to brew a lager style beer with 100% green malt. So this, if you like, is the hardest challenge in green malt brewing. I said that the, the early researchers at Guinness uh, did 100% did green malt brewing with a stout, but um, um, I should say 100% of the base malt, clearly with other roasted additions. And the robust flavour of that um, uh, beverage means that you can cover up some of the defects that then come through in a lager beer style. And we evaluated the feasibility of brewing using these conditions to limit lipoxygenase activity. Um, practically how it worked, we did six pairs of brews. The malt was made at, at Bort Malt's um, Antwerp maltings, sampled and taken across uh, to Ghent to the brewery. And we used um, six green malt samples and the kilned malts from the same batch going through the maltings. So there were six pairs, if you like, of a green malt that was used to brew and the corresponding kilned Pilsner malt, which was what was being manufactured, um, uh, were used as the paired comparisons. Uh, the brewing process here, this shows the um, innovative brew line in the brewery at, uh, at Leuven. I'll just highlight some of the factors that are important to the sort of success of the brewing trials. Um, here we see we start with the milling. Um, it's a wet milling process and we're milling under a blanket of CO2 to keep oxygen out with deaerated liquor. So wet milling of the intact green malt going into the mash vessel. 
um, and indeed then in the control of the Pilsner mold. Uh, all the details here are merely saying that we matched levels of calcium and lactic acid. The lactic acid is being added to make sure the pH is optimal um, and well away from the lipoxygenase uh, optimum. Uh, and the different concentrations are merely reflecting the differences in the water that's used. So they're calculated so that you get the same overall concentrations in the mash. But because you've got high moisture content in the green malt, you have to take that water into account in terms of the concentrations added in the water that you're uh, mashing with. Uh, we used a thin bed mash filter. Um, so, you know, essential when using a, a wet milling process. Um, because we're going to pulverize the husk effectively. Uh, and then um, probably other key things. There's nothing too unusual about the boil. It was a straightforward boil. We've got the additions and we were targeting uh, 29 bitterness units in the finished beer. Uh, the other thing I'd point out, we fermented with um, Fermentis SO4 at 24 degrees. So this is a fast, uh, warm fermentation um, with a 14 day maturation at zero degrees. So a really fast, rapid, vigorous, warm fermentation. I'll come back to that in a moment. And here's our final um, beer analysis. Um, and on the left is the kiln malt, and on the right is the green malt. And I guess easy take home story is if you look and compare the figures across with the standard deviations of six replicate brews, uh, broadly speaking, we matched the spec. There were some differences, um, but it was quite possible to process and brew lager beers. So I'll show you them in a moment. Uh, we've got a slightly lower pH for the green malt beer, uh, implying it had less buffering capacity in it. And indeed, in this case, most, most of the buffering capacity in, in beers comes from free amino nitrogen. And you'll see we did in our uh, examples have around about half of the residual free amino nitrogen in the green malt beer relative to the kiln malt. But focusing in on the two key challenges, um, we were really rather pleased um, in terms of, um, sorry, uh, dimethyl sulfide, you'll notice that um, we've got 24.3 uh, parts per billion micrograms per litre in the kiln malt beer and 23.8 in the green malt. So the elevated level of S-methylmethionine, which is still there in the finished beer, you'll see 136 relative to 44, didn't actually result in elevated DMS in the beer. And that is because of efficient stripping during boiling and indeed during that fast, vigorous fermentation at 24 degrees. So we had high levels of the precursor, we had them all the way through the process, but we managed them and therefore we didn't get elevated DMS in the finished lager. And here's the data supporting, you know, saying that we manage these. At the top, you've got SMM, green malt, brewing process versus the kiln malt. And again, you'll just see all the way through um, that uh, the green malt SMM is higher substantially higher uh, right through into the finished beer. So at all stages of the process, this is a thermal breakdown. You've always got the, pro the um, option that you can form more DMS by breakdown of S-methylmethionine. There's always that presence in the brew stream, but it was managed. And as I say, when we look at the DMS, actually the specification in finished beer was very similar. There was a little difference in the pitching work when we go into the fermentation and that's been leveled out by that vigorous fermentation. So that takes advantage of the fact that DMS really is rather volatile. Still wanting to make sure that that elevated level of S-methylmethionine wasn't gonna come back and bite us because every time that you have a thermal process in your, um, in your brewing process, you can break down S-methylmethionine to form um, more um, DMS and the last step, the last thermal step typically is pasteurization in pack. And if you're going to form a lot more DMS there, uh, then you could add this cooked corn characteristic into the finished beer. So we did some trials. Um, you can see for uh, three pairs of green malt and kiln malt beers um, where we've got the unpasteurized DMS levels, uh, 20 pasteurization units, 40 and 60. So three different pasteurization processes, uh, a typical pasteurization process in a brewery would aim for about 15 to 30 PUs. So we've done quite rigorous heat treatment and you can see that only in one instance did we even get close to the sensory threshold and then only at the two highest 
pasteurization unit levels, which, as I say, are untypically high. In all the others, we controlled DMS beneath sensory threshold. So again, uh, using careful uh, processing, we can control um, the um, DMS levels. So on this uh, slide, I'm going to sort of uh, just make a few conclusions and uh, refer you to the paper if you want to know more. Here's our uh, two beers, the green malt beer on the left, um, the all um, uh, conventional Pilsner malt beer on the right. Our summary, um, you know, was that we produced beers with no significant taints or off flavors, no DMS problem, had a low thiobarbituric acid index, that's a, a, a measure of uh, aldehydes, which again uh, is, is with reference to staling of the beer through shelf life. It had acceptable color pH and foam, low levels of trihydroxy fatty acid levels, those indicators of lipid oxidation, and therefore promising flavor stability metrics. Now then, I've said a lot about it, about matching specification, absence of taints. What did it actually taste like? Um, was it the best lager beer I ever tasted? Absolutely not. Uh, was it a representative lager beer free from taints? Yes. It had a little bit of a sort of green beanie characteristic to it, but it was a, a product in its own right. Uh, and as I say, it was recognizably a lager beer and we produced it under the most demanding circumstances, 100% green malt. Uh, clearly, we don't need to always brew with 100% green malt. A couple of slides very quickly showing that um, it does look like whatever that fresh flavor is, that the absence of kilning benefits the stability of the beer. So these are results to electron paramagnetic resonance spectroscopy, which we use to look at forcing of the beer, and we measure the formation of free radical species over time. And the common index quoted is the T150, the number of free radicals formed under forcing conditions after 150 minutes. So high is bad, <laughs> uh, basically. And you can see that the green malt is always significantly lower than the kiln malt, both in the work before fermentation and in the finished beer after fermentation. So we think that the green malt beers had good oxidative stability. And then in terms of these staling aldehydes that I've mentioned a couple of times, just to summarize here as well, um, the uh, PCA here, which is explaining um, somewhere close to 85% of the variance in the data set, um, is plotting the samples, which are either GM for green malt or KM for kiln malt, and the levels of the key staling aldehydes. So these red labels on the right hand side, as, as we look, are three methyl butanol from top to bottom, two methyl propanol, phenyl acetaldehyde, et cetera. These are all staling aldehydes that brewers will want to avoid the release of through shelf life. And very simply, you can look at this and see that it's the kiln malt samples and those that have been stored for longer periods. The number is the, the storage days um, through the shelf stability trial. And there, you know, it's the kiln malt beers and those that have been stored for longer that are producing high volumes of staling aldehydes. So to summarize what that study found, well, the opportunities um, of green malt boon, there are many. Um, it's environmentally friendly, so you could capitalize on that and produce beer with reduced carbon and water footprints. You might choose to create a new market for green malt beer. In other words, not try to directly flavor match existing, and you might just make a virtue of difference and say, here is a green malt beer. Is there a consumer out there who likes this because it's environmentally friendly? It might create more flavor stable beers. As I say, I think we need more work on the on the flavor characteristics uh, sensorially and exactly um, how stable that is. We could, of course, adapt this and use with small quantities of roasted malts in the grist to add color and flavor and more closely approach the conventional kiln malt flavor. And green malt can be used as an enzyme rich adjunct to a digest unmalted adjunct material. So you could link up my two presentations and brew with both green malt and unmalted barley. Some of the challenges are still the lack of storability. And this is the big one that stops widespread adoption at the, at the moment, even with the uh, proof of principle. So you need a maltings co-located with a brewery. Uh, and this does exist across the globe and people are doing this. But at the moment, if you don't have your maltings closely co-located, then the idea of transporting high water 
perishable material like green mold isn't really practical. It's a disruptive technology potentially. So, you know, breweries aren't at the moment, um, uh, you know, equipped with wet mills in an atmosphere control. We take all this on board. You know, the research was intended to be future looking and building capacity. Um, you do have to maintain control of those high SMM levels, the dimethyl sulfide precursor. They were there all the way through the process. We showed that it can be done, but if adapting this to any other brewing process, you'd need to keep an eye on that. And of course, there's consumer acceptance, which is always a challenge with new beer styles. Well, the market is showing interest. Just to finish and show you some of the uh, green malt beer products that have been out there. So Horton Ridge Brewery in Nova Scotia produced this green malt beer. Heavily is, is um, a Belgian Abbey beer that um, uh, worked together with developing technologies for green malt brewing uh, and produced and marketed their own green malt beers. Uh, I'm also collaborating with breweries in Germany presently who want to use the technology, um, but are using it more to use green malt as an adjunct. So, um, you know, large scale production will take time and investment. And we still need a better understanding of the sensory properties of green malt beers. We'd like to work with null locks barley varieties as well. Um, and, uh, you know, see if that allows more flexibility um, in the brewing process. And there's some optimization of brewing protocols and equipment going to be necessary in all um, brewing processes. So thank you for coming with me on this uh, journey through, uh, I guess, a bit of introduction and two um, case studies of recent research we've been engaged in at Nottingham that show you some of the different angles to barley as a raw material in brewing. I just tried to make some concluding remarks here really to tie that all together. So, you know, globally, barley continues to be the enduring cereal of choice for brewing. So it's still it's still top dog in terms of barley malt is the usual um, uh, base grist material for brewing. But as I've shown you, there's a lot of other adjunct materials also being used. A modern brewing is much less constrained by tradition. Um, even than, you know, 20, 30 years ago, the sustainability and the pressures of the uh, environment and what lays ahead of us in the 21st century, that's all playing a role in um, this diversification and looking at uh, differences in raw material selection. So the global market's diversifying. Um, part of this is, of course, all a big part of the trend towards craft in the industry and diversification of beer styles. People are looking much more now, uh, the use of different um, cereals, hops, et cetera, to make different beers. Um, but also, as I say, there is this aspect of where everybody is having to move to being more sustainable. And I hope I've shown you barley can be used in a variety of forms, which augment the traditional use of pale malt, but with potential to lower carbon footprint. And that's where we've been engaged in some research um, uh, in the areas of unmalted barley or green malt, as uh, discussed here. And I'd just like to um, conclude by thanking the uh, PhD researchers who were pivotal to those two projects. So it was uh, my colleague, Dr. Joanna York, uh, postdoc with us, who um, uh, worked on the unmalted barley brewing process, and Selena Dugalan, now with Murphy and Son in the UK, who did the work on uh, green malt brewing along with a field of, uh, of stars collaborators across this European project, as you will note. So um, thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to open it up now to questions and see what's in the chat. Okay, thank you very much, David. Um, very interesting uh, presentation. Um, uh, I see we have got a question here from Malcolm. Did you study, uh, did you study the effect of barley varieties on green malt flavour? No, we didn't. And in fact, uh, it's very interesting, Malcolm, for sure. I mean, I think there's been a lot of interesting work done on the the impact of barley variety on, on, on finished beer. Um, but no, we didn't get a chance to look at that. It was really the uh, the technical differences and, and overcoming and developing the, the technical process for brewing lager beers with um, green malt that we focused on. I think I concluded by saying that actually a bit that we missed and it was purely because of time of the project. It was a three year EU project and we, we packed a lot into it, but there wasn't time and there wasn't money allocated for, you know, the detailed kind of sensory evaluate evaluation, such as, you know, QDA that we would have needed to look at the characteristics of the beer. And you'd need that really to start to compare different, different varieties of barley. Uh, 
but interesting question for the future and as this takes off and uh, I, I would say that actually out of out of most of our publications um over recent years they, they all get different indexes and um you know the citation index and how it's used by the scientific community can be one thing but actually in terms of being picked up on by the industry i, I get most contacts about the green malt brewing work and i'm getting a, you know a, an awful lot of invitations to talk or um to advise people and help people with starting to set up variants using green malt as a as a, a raw material Okay, we've got um, a question here from Clois. Um, CO2 footprints using enzymes. Has the production of the enzyme been included in the com comparison? Yeah, it, it has, and I tried to cover that at the time. It's they're not my figures, which is why I did explain that they're published by an enzyme company, Dupont. So we should maybe assume that they've picked in their life cycle the most favourable conditions over which to compare. But the the papers there, I, I put the uh, I deliberately because I was. I quite shamelessly just used their um, their data just to make a link and say, yes, in general, it's hard to argue that if you don't malt, you save in terms of energy and carbon footprint, even when you take the enzyme production into account. Um, but yeah, I put the, the reference to the paper, it's a 2020 M MBAA technical quarterly, and uh, you can take a look at it and clearly they do run through all of the constraints and boundaries on the LCA and what's included and what isn't. Uh, and I have read it and I checked through it and checked at the top level that it's, um, you know, it, it has credence. I would argue one of the authors also worked for Novozymes and, and, and previously presented a lot of that life cycle information as well, um, going back a good number of years. So, yes, it, 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 the short answer is, that yes, it does include the uh, life cycle of the enzymes. Okay, have we any other questions you'd like to bring forward, uh, David? David, um, what, what's the big driver in this research? It, was it for sustainability or was it to see where we could introduce new flavours or what, what was the big driver uh, for this research? Well, the big, the big driver would be different in each case because clearly they're part of different, different projects. Um, for the green malt, I would say it was definitely sustainability. That was what it was all about. Um, and, and starting, uh, and I, I laid out quite bare. I mean, I mean I've, I've sort of, you know, been researching in in in, um, in malting and brewing over the last sort of 20, 25 years. And I, I, I've followed the journey of, of, of people sort of developing uh, unmalted barley brewing with enzymes and Novozymes coming out with Ondea Pro and then all the other enzyme manufacturers producing their perfect blend of enzymes to, to mimic barley and break down grist materials. Um, and I always had that feeling, well, you know, because I was I was there at some of these conferences where there'd be huge arguments between the monsters and the enzyme manufacturers. And, you know, you're trying to put us out of a job and, and you know, and I always had that feeling that basically uh, the malting industry could still have a role because it's it's, as I said, a, a really old ancient biotechnology. Why would we pay enzyme companies to produce enzymes if you can naturally produce green malt, which contains them? So genuinely, that was my thinking and my my thoughts for wanting to get involved in that area um uh in terms of the uh unmalted barley this was really um a question coming from the industry in terms of what is the upwards uh, limit on incorporation of unmalted adjuncts their perspective would have doubtless been multiple you know it would have been a mixture of those things that i showed you from functionality economics um but also the sustainability in the life cycle um so you know if they could incorporate if they could increase the level the perspective there is much more obviously from flavor matching and that's why the limitations on flavor that happen as you go to the high concentrations that that lingering bitterness uh, and astringency that starts to creep in and be reported that was their real focus um so flavor matching was very much the the focus there and i think we've got another one here from voice which actually uh, quite nicely comes into this do you see a real potential for green beer also looking at young younger generation of beer drinkers there is a lot of craft beers. Could it extend the line of products? I do think so. And again, um, you know, I covered the aspects. The usual thing that gets thrown back at you when you when you go out and present this kind of work is, well, in some instances, it's just not practical. And of course, um, you know, then when I sit down and and, and chat to the uh, the heads of the biggest malton companies in the world, they say, yeah, but actually, in a lot of cases, it is. Um, I mean, AB InBev are now the biggest malting company in the world. They're just just outstrip the uh, production of bought malt. 
and they clearly produce a lot of the malt for their own breweries and in some countries those plant are co-located so uh, i'm not saying ab InBev are going to jump straight into it but you know i'm just saying feasibly at the large scale it's possible at the small scale at craft it's even more possible because you can imagine how somebody could quite deliberately co-locate a small craft maltings with a craft brewery and choose to brew from green malt that that nova scotia um, brewing company that i cited there that's clearly a that's a small run um, a brewing company one that's doing it on a small scale that can afford to take a bit of a risk get the i was there first into the market claim and see whether it sells and whether it, it develops a, a, a taste uh, uh, with the consumers but you're absolutely right. Sorry, I, I don't. Was it Joyce? Did you say raise the question? No, Joyce. Oh, sorry. But yeah, absolutely spot on um, in terms of the younger consumer. And, you know, it is one of the things that, that could be attractive. I think there's, you know, there's a range of uses for, for green malt. I didn't mention already, and probably within the audience, people will know that portions of green malt have been used in the distilling industry for quite a, a while already for its high enzymatic activity um, to digest and help digest other crisp materials so um you know again using portions of green malt is really i think the research has shown it, it's really quite practical in terms of substituting it okay um we've got i've got three questions here that come from donna um and why is there a demand for new raw material being used in brewing um the second one is do we have courses that you run uh, brewing science and how important are they for bringing new, new talent into the brewing industry? And at Hutton, we are trying to encourage interaction with the barley community and across supply chains. What does what does being part of broader science communities mean to you? Oh, so, okay, I answered some of those in the, um, you, you've teed me up nicely because I answered some of those in your sort of introductory publicity documents. Can we take them one at a time? And do you mind? I, yeah. I can't see those in the chat, actually. Or no, no, they've the come through. Chat. Donna sent me these through privately, so... Oh, I would could you just read them again one by one, and I'll answer okay. one by one. Right. Why, is, the, why is, the, is there a demand for new raw material being used in brewing? Look, it, it, it really could come from a huge number of areas, and I tried to, you know, it was the slide, why do we use adjuncts? Um, there's a lot of stimulus coming from craft, undoubtedly, because... Uh, from the bottom up, if you like, they're educating the consumer and getting people interested in diversity and different beer styles and to produce different beer styles. Historically, there are many different beer styles across the world, you know, you know a huge variety and range. Um, but most of them have been very, very low in volume. But now people are starting sort of through craft, through acquisition of craft companies in some of the bigger brewing companies cases are starting to produce a wider range of beer styles than just maybe lagers and ales in this part of the world. Um, so that that's one of the drivers for diversity. Um, and then, of course, there's all of the other pressures that I've that I've mentioned around um, sort of sustainability, environmental footprint. Um, there's cost, there's pressures on supply chain, there's changes in environment directly as opposed to just for sustainability. So um, changes in climate, a change in yields for some of the key crop producing regions. Um, so again, it's all about security, security of supply at the big scale um, and, and, and having cheap and reliable sources of materials to brew with. Okay. Um, these are all questions you answered in your introduction, David, when you sent it in. But just so that we can capture them on the on the sure. um, uh, yeah, no problem. Very happy to. Yes. So the second one: Do you have courses that you run in brewing science, and how important are they for bringing new talent to the malting and brewing industry? We do indeed, and thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about them. Um, yeah, we run um, several different uh, courses that are important. Um, our main portfolio of courses are at postgraduate level, so we run a, a flagship course, I guess, is the Masters in Brewing Science, but we run both a full-time course, which is a one-year graduate course that takes um, graduates from science or engineering who don't necessarily have a background in brewing. Often they've got an enthusiasm for it or they homebrew, um, but they don't have a background in industrial brewing. And we equip them with the skills over 12 years with a course totally dedicated to brewing. It has uh, 120 credits of taught modules that are totally bespoke and dedicated to brewing. There are no other modules from the uh, the university. They're all dedicated brewing modules. And it makes a really 
very specialist conversion between other scientific disciplines and going out and getting your first destination job in the industry. Uh, the other credits for a master's, of course, are a research project, which gives students a chance to uh, go out and uh, do a targeted research project in collaboration with partners in industry or on a research project in a lab with an academic at the university. Um, so that's a, a one year full time masters, and that really is producing new talent for the industry. And usually it's 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 a small um, uh, but specialized course, so sort of typically capped up, up to about 15 students a year. Um, and typically we don't find any difficulty finding those students jobs. So it's very nicely linked into employability. There's a demand for suitably qualified and talented brewers. Uh, further to that, we also do a part time distance learning version of the same course. Um, usually studied by people already in the industry around their work. So whereas a master's might take three years to study for, sorry, sorry, one year to study for full time, it's three years by part time distance learning, but you can get there while you work at the same route and uh, get yourself a qualification. Uh, and uh, last but not least, I suppose we offer all of those uh, modules of our postgraduate brewing program as individual short courses. So you don't have to sign up for a full program. You can come and become an expert in brewing raw materials and work production or yeast and fermentation or brewery yeast management, brewing microbiology, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we, we market all those as individual short courses. And uh, again, last but not least, we have a flourishing brewing apprenticeship program. So in, in England, sadly, uh, not in Scotland or, or, or Wales um, due to the nature of the apprenticeship scheme, um, but we are the approved uh, training provider together with the Institute of Brewing and HIT for the uh, England um, Brewing Apprenticeship Level 4. So we've got about 60 young brewers a year coming through an apprenticeship course at Nottingham, um, you know, fresh into the industry, learning um, the core competencies and skills um, uh, through um, six blocks of two days each held at the University of Intensive Training uh, and then, you know, on, on site training and support visits. So, yeah, we, we do a lot of uh, brewing training and education. And I think as a department, we take that very seriously in our role in the sort of in the greater industry in which we're embedded. And uh, over many years, of course, that always comes back because you you are educating the people who are the future of the industry that you're working with and supporting. And finally, David, at Hutton, we are trying to encourage interaction with the barley community and across the supply chain. What does being part of the broader scientific community mean to you? Um, a great deal, uh, because, you know, without collaboration across sort of different silos of research, we are limited. You know, you can't just sit in a, say, brewing process um, silo and uh, see everything from your perspective in your own scientific discipline. Science, you know, you know, the products of doing that are probably um, pretty much pushed as far as they can go, um, uh, apart from really novel innovation. Um, but where a lot of the ground remains to be developed is in multidisciplinary science. So, yeah, getting involved, working across the chain, understanding the raw materials, particularly with relevance to the International Barley Hub. Um, I mean, I'm a, a key member on the uh, executive board of Baritone, um, which is a um, BBSRC-sponsored collaborative training partnership um, with, with key input from James Hutton Institute and the University of Dundee, but with Nottingham as a, a satellite and a partner. And we're very proud to be a part of that and working together to train 30 PhD students over the next three years. We've just started, we're in the first year. Um, and equip them with the skills uh, and also to do PhD level research to help push forward the future sustainable supply of UK barley. So, yeah, I do really think it's very important to work across the chain, um, you know, with barley breeders, growers, um, grain merchants, uh, monsters, right the way through um, brewers uh, and indeed distillers where relevant. So, yeah, it's, it's important because otherwise we only see one set of skills. And even within the university, we collaborate very widely across disciplines. You know, you have lots of projects with engineering, um, and then you bring in a different skill set and mindset, and uh, you know, a different context. And um, we collaborate, of course, with our own plant and crop science department and experts on barley over there. So, yeah, great point. Um, no, no, thank you very much. I had a great pleasure of meeting your PhD student last week. I've been uh, at two events where they're both uh, where they've been there. And uh, it's good to see them uh, on the ground and, and starting their research. So thank you very much. Um, Excellent.
just to say that our next uh, seminar is on the 17th of November. Jessica, have you got a, a slide plot for this one? No, we don't have slides, George. I've just put the information into yeah. the chat. So the information's in the chat box. Um, so we've got uh, it's by if we're by Victoria Blake uh, from Montana, and just to make note that the take the take the start time is uh, three o'clock, not two o'clock, and that's just to accommodate uh, time differences there. Um, and it's navigating GWAS results on the the Grain Genes uh, One X versus three Geno browsers. So again, uh, log in to uh, Eventbrite and uh, join us then. Um, just to say that uh, we have much pleasure in announcing that our first two buildings under the uh, International Barley Hub, we got possession of them last week. So we are now into two of the new buildings. That's the farm buildings and the uh, uh, Barley Field Centre. And uh, we will be putting bricks and mortar down in the ground for the main building uh, in the next uh, 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 by, by Christmas, brought by Christmas. So we're moving on quite nicely with International Barley Hub as well. Um, all I can say is thank you very much for your attendance. Um, we look forward to seeing you again uh, in a fortnight's time. But if you don't, if you don't make it, then by all means join us uh, in some of the uh, sessions we're going to have in the new year. Thank you very much for your attendance and uh, look forward to meeting up again.